Hey, welcome to this explainer. I'm Dr. Pito, and uh, I'm gonna talk about as briefly as possible how to do your digital presentation on the weekly course material. So just as a reminder, every week that we have a digital presentation, it'll be uploaded on Wednesday, and then the rest of class will be responding to one of the individual presentations by Sunday. And there are three goals for making these presentations. Sometimes we call these things learning outcomes. And the first learning outcome is just to communicate what you've learned to your classmates. And the second outcome, to develop your ability to analyze the readings. This is a really specific thing, especially in college. And by doing assignments like this, it teaches you how to analyze academic readings in a really specific kind of way. And the third learning outcome, the last one, how academic ideas, ideas that seem really abstract or complicated, discover how they're relevant to your lived experience. So let's go ahead and try to figure out how exactly do we do these presentations. The first thing that I have to make clear is that I use this word reading a lot. What I mean is the journal articles or the book chapters that are assigned to you every week. So let me go ahead and explain exactly how to do these presentations. There are three main parts to doing the presentation. The first is to summarize the reading. The second is to explain something that really sticks out to you about the reading. And the third thing is to connect what is so interesting to you about the reading with a personal experience. The first thing that you have to do when you're summarizing is to identify the thesis. The thesis statement is usually a sentence, two sentences, it's sometimes even three sentences. And what these sentences do is they express explicitly, clearly, what the author is trying to prove. In your presentation, I want you to clearly show your classmates and I where you can find this thesis statement or these thesis statements. Let me go to the reading for this week to give you an example of what I'm talking about when I say identify the thesis. Now in the reading for this week, the author, Dean Serenio, he's trying to talk about Filipinos who live in Hawaii, but he's talking about them in a really specific way that challenges a lot of how people think and talk about this idea of identity especially when it comes to Filipino Americans. When you look at an academic article like this, a lot of students get lost in the concepts and the language that they're just inundated with when it comes to academic articles. But a lot of academic articles are actually written in the same kind of way. Let me explain what I mean by that. The introduction is usually a few paragraphs long, and what it does is it situates the reader in the argument. And sometimes the thesis statement is at the very end of the first paragraph of the introduction. But if you look at the article, this last sentence right here, this isn't the thesis statement. And the reason I know this is because if you read this sentence, now the sentences before this last sentence aren't building up in such a way that they're trying to prove that last sentence. That last sentence actually comes off like a statement of fact. Thesis statements are built up in a kind of way where you don't necessarily agree with the author. But that's the whole point. The author is writing this paper, this chapter, this book to try to prove that statement. So let's try to find a statement that looks more like that. If we go down to the second page, Right into the first paragraph, you see all of these questions. In this essay, I show how the U.S. colonization of Hawaii conceals itself, maneuvering historically oppressed groups against indigenous peoples. Now that's a thesis statement. It says it in this essay. This is what I want to do. In this book, in this paper, I'm trying to argue. A lot of times thesis statements start like that. It's signaling to you, this is what the author is trying to prove. 
When you get past the frustration of not understanding the wording and you just look at the sentences and just ask yourself, are these sentences being built up in such a way where I feel like this is the main point, this is the thing that the author is really trying to say, but also that they're intending to prove, that's the thesis statement. The way that a thesis statement is proven is through evidence. And that's the second part of summarizing the article in your presentation. I want you to identify what's the supporting evidence. You don't have to talk about it in deep detail. In a lot of what you read, the evidence that authors use is actually pretty limited. And the reason for this is because you're not reading a book. A lot of times you're not even reading chapters. You're reading a few pages and in those pages, the author has to quickly and strongly support what their thesis statement is. So you explain the supporting evidence by identifying it in the article. Show us in the article the sentences. So let's go back to the article so I can try and give you some examples of what I mean by evidence. So in the article, I told you that this was the thesis statement, two sentences actually. The first one talks about what the United States is doing to Hawaii. It's trying to conceal what it's done historically to Hawaii, and it's having this impact on people of color, dividing them from indigenous people in the United States. And the second sentence is more specifically talking about Filipino Americans, calling them Filipino settlers, and trying to talk about how they feel, how they identify with the United States in a US colony in Hawaii. So how does the author prove this? Well, really, he just uses two main sources of evidence to prove this idea. Whether that's strong or compelling to you, that's not important right now. What's important is that you identify what is the evidence that the author is using. In order to find evidence, we have to go a little bit further down. And there's a section that's talking about colonial miseducation, but it's talking about it in Hawaii. And to summarize this, just for the purpose of this explainer, what the author does is he uses this person right here, what this person wrote in order to explain just how complicated and how difficult it is to reconcile being a Filipino immigrant settling into the United States in a place like Hawaii. And the reason for that is when Filipinos become aware of a lot of the historical things that have happened to Filipino Americans, they tend to feel like an oppressed and marginalized community. And in a lot of ways, they are. But this article is complicating that idea. And so he uses this person in order to highlight those complications. And this person that he uses, Joshua Oxalou, he epitomized a lot of the aspirations that Filipinos and other immigrants have to become American. And that's the whole point of colonial education, was to Americanize the people who were colonized. And the second piece of evidence that he uses is statements and media that was written in Hawaii about Philippine Independence Day. Without going into too much detail about the article, I mostly just want to explain that the author uses celebrations for Philippine Independence Day in Hawaii to explain that a lot of times, even when Filipinos are trying to celebrate their independence from American colonialism, they often ignore the impact of what their settlement in Hawaii has done to the native indigenous populations. Now going back to the presentation, after you find the evidence that supports the thesis, the last thing that I want you to do is to identify and define key concepts in the article. The most important concept that the author introduces is the concept of the settler. And in your presentation, I want you to literally find where the concept is being defined. 
Here on page 126, the author uses another author to try to explain this concept. That this word settler is a means to an end. The way that the author is trying to use it is up here in the page before. Thus, Trask introduced the term settler to describe the non-native community. And the usefulness of this term for me is that it shatters U.S. paradigms by forcing non-natives to question our participation in sustaining U.S. colonialism. I want you to try to define in your own way what these concepts mean. I always want you to try to use your own words, even though you're showing your classmates quotes and sentences from the article. And then I want you to go ahead and explain why the author uses these concepts. In this article, Sarah Neo uses this word settler in order to help people, especially Filipino Americans, to understand that their idea of being a marginalized and oppressed person and that their community has been historically oppressed doesn't absolve them when they live in a place like Hawaii from all of their impacts of settling into a country that is not theirs, a country that's been colonized by another government. Now, after you're done summarizing the reading, then I want you to move into part two of the assignment. In part two of the assignment, I want you to identify something, something in the article that stands out to you, something that feels important or just really interesting. And then I want you to explain it. I want you to show us where in the article you found this thing. It could be a song, it could be a poem, it could be a story or a character. It could be a concept. But just tell us what it is, where it is, and why it's important. And this dovetails into part three of the assignment. I want you to use a personal experience to help explain that example from the article. Remember, I don't only want you to provide an example from your life experiences that connects to this example in the article. I want you to use that experience to explain that example. And I also want you to make sure that you use an image, a song, some kind of visual aid to help your classmates really see and understand what your personal experience is that you're using to explain what's so interesting to you about the reading. I barely related to the focus of this week's reading. I'm not from Hawaii. I've gone to Hawaii a handful of times. I haven't studied Hawaii anywhere near as deeply as I should, but I could still find concepts in the article that connect to my personal experiences. Try to bear with me when I try to share this personal experience in order to one, illustrate a concept that stands out to me about this article, but also to just give you an example of how to do this for your assignment. You know, back when I was in high school, I went to a high school in Southern California that was extremely different than what it looks like right now. If I type in the name of my high school, Valley Christian High School in Artesia, and I see images of what the high school looks like now, especially the students. You can look at any of these images from my old high school, or let's look at this one. Let's take a look at this one. Move me out of the way for a moment. This image is incredibly <laughs> striking to me. And the reason for that is that when I went to high school, this looked nothing like any of the student bodies, any of the athletes who attended my high school when I was there. When I was in high school at Valley Christian High, I was one of 12 Asian Americans in the entire high school, 12. And in my class, there was one other Asian and no Filipinos. So you can imagine that back in high school, it was a really strange period of time for me. And the reason for that wasn't simply because there were so few Asians and even less Filipinos who went to my high school. There were four of us, by the way. 
Now the reason for that was because when I was in high school, Bellflower, the city adjacent to my high school, was kind of in the middle of a racial crisis. The community that established my high school back in the early 1900s was a Dutch farming community and their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren all went to Valley Christian High School. And this community of Dutch Americans, well, they saw themselves as a very small minority within Southern California that was different than other white Americans. So when I was trying to make sense of what it meant to be a person of color, someone who was different, a minority in the United States, in a place like California, I was also at the same time experiencing a lot of racial abuse from this small community of Dutch Americans at my high school. This community of Dutch Americans communicated to me almost every single day that I didn't belong at that school. And if you weren't Dutch, well, like they would say, you ain't much. And this experience of this small community feeling so fragile and so threatened, it was a real experience when I went to high school. Now that's obviously different from what Serenio is talking about when he's talking about Filipinos in Hawaii. Filipinos in Hawaii who experience a lot of the same kind of poverty and rates of crime and violence that native Hawaiians experience in Hawaii. Well, this is the experience of two marginalized and non-white communities. But unlike that Dutch community in my high school, a minority who was at the same time, in very many ways, part of the majority, Native Hawaiians are both the minority and super minority compared to other Asian Americans in Hawaii. So a few other things to remember when it comes to completing your digital presentation. The first thing is that this presentation has to be recorded using some kind of digital software. You can use Zoom. Right now I'm using OBS. Some of you might even stream. You can use that software, it doesn't matter, but it's really important that you submit your assignment through a video format so that we can see you giving this presentation. And the way that you're gonna give this presentation is through PowerPoint, through Keynote, through Google Slides. You have to use some sort of visual imagery in order to present your ideas. Be sure that you remember to introduce yourself at the beginning of your presentation. And I want you to just express right from the beginning something that you find really interesting about the class. And lastly, make sure that your presentation is at least five minutes long. Okay, let's move on to the responses to the presentations. Like I said at the beginning of the video, all of the students who aren't completing a digital presentation will be responding to one of the presentations each week. And out of the 11 weeks that presentations will be given, students have to do at minimum five presentations. You don't have to do responses for every single week. And this is how you do your responses. Your responses should be one to two paragraphs four to five sentences each. The first thing that I want you to do is to just acknowledge your classmate. Make sure that you tell them, I really enjoyed this presentation. I was really fascinated by this about the presentation because. After you do that, identify a quote from the reading. This is the part of the response where you try to communicate to me that you did some or all of the reading. Maybe you didn't understand it, but you did some of it. Pick a quote, a paragraph, something specific in the article that you believe is connected to the presentation that you're responding to. And lastly, identify something in the lecture video that week, a quote, some part of the lecture video that connects to the quote in the reading that you're responding with. 
All right, I know the assignment might feel a little intimidating, especially the presentation part. But remember, it's a big part of your overall grade. If you have any questions about how to do your presentation, about the article that you're presenting on, not only can you email me, but you're welcome to meet with me over Zoom and we can do problem solving together. I'm sure that I can help you find personal experiences that relate to the reading. All right, Inga, take care.